All right, guys, so I got a couple different Israel updates that I want to get to here with y'all. We're going to talk about Israel ramping up their offensive inside of Rafa. We're also going to talk about some newly uncovered atrocities in Gaza in the West Bank. And before we get to that, we're going to hop into this story of the Joe Biden administration being set to announce a slate of sanctions, limited sanctions against a specific IDF battalion. Okay, so here Axios, Barack Ravid, they report on this. So what are they talking about? U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken is expected to, within days, announce sanctions against the Israel Defense Forces Netza Yehuda Battalion for human rights violations in the occupied West Bank, three U.S. sources with knowledge of the issue told Axios. So it would be the first time that the U.S. has imposed sanctions on an Israeli military unit. Let's just pause on that for a second. Okay, we're going to talk about the flaws of this specific, you know, kind of sanctioning or whatever. This is the first time, okay, that the U.S. has imposed sanctions on an Israeli military unit. Think about all of the different war crimes, human rights abuses, reports of torture, the killing of innocent men, women, children, medics, journalists that we have seen. This is the first time that an IDF battalion is getting sanctioned. Okay, the sanctions will ban the battalion and its members from receiving any kind of U.S. military assistance or training, according to the sources. So they say the 1997 law, authored by then-Senator Patrick Leahy, prohibits U.S. foreign aid and Defense Department training programs from going to foreign security, military, and police units credibly alleged to have committed human rights abuses. Okay, so first off, on this, this upper portion of this here, right? So... As pointed out here by Stephen Semler, I think this is a good point. They say they're going to ban weapons or training from getting to this specific IDF battalion. Now, it's important to note that the, the Israeli government, and we're going to get to Benjamin Netanyahu's response to this here, but the Israeli government and, and even foreign, you know, former ministers like uh, uh, Benny Gantz, they were coming out and saying this IDF unit is not uniquely evil. They haven't done anything wrong. In fact, they're basically a representative or a representation of what we've been doing in Gaza. They're a core part of our offensive in Gaza, which says a lot, right, to say that this, like, you know, human rights abusing IDF battalion that even the U.S. recognizes has committed crimes against humanity, that the Israeli government is saying, no, 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 this is like a unit that represents what we are doing, okay? So that, that's an important takeaway from this. But the other important takeaway from this is that as pointed out here by Steven Semler, the U.S. can't enforce a ban on military aid to this battalion because it doesn't have a mechanism to accurately track which weapons go to which Israeli units, and Biden has no plans to set one up, which is a critical detail that's left out of this initial report here, right? Because in theory, yeah, it's good, you shouldn't be giving weapons or training to an IDF battalion that has been credibly accused of human rights abuses. It's illegal for you to do that under the Leahy law, as they, they point out here, right? And so... The, the first question is, like, how are you actually even going to enforce this? Because the, the Netanyahu government has made it explicitly clear they're not going to go along with this. Okay, if anything, they'll just do a short little workaround and then keep giving weapons to this battalion, keeping them in action inside of Gaza. There, there's no reason for them to go along with this, okay? It's just, it seems like just another virtue signal. Now, I'm glad to some extent that it's like, okay, you're willing to sanction this battalion. There, there's something going on here. But also... These sanctions are coming as a result, not of anything that's been done in Gaza, not even of anything that's been done in the West Bank since October 7th. It's being done as a result of actions that were taken by this battalion, you know, potentially months or years ago inside of the West Bank. So this is not Biden waking up to what's happening in Gaza or being critical or cracking down on Israel for what's happening in Gaza right now or the West Bank for that matter. It's just like a specific, very highly targeted, unenforceable set of sanctions against like one IDF battalion. That's what this is, okay? Now again, if you look at the law here, as they outline, it's illegal for us to be sending weapons to a military that is credibly accused of human rights abuses. Does that not apply to the entirety of what Israel has been doing inside of Gaza? 15,000 dead kids wasn't enough. The obliteration of all civilian infrastructure, the targeting of mosques and schools and churches and hospitals and UN shelters and refugee camps, all of the above, that wasn't enough. The controlled demolition of, of university buildings, the starvation of civilians, innocent men, women, and children who are starving to death because of Israel's blockading of aid since October 7th, none of that was a human rights violation. None of that was, was against international law. Of course, all of it was. From the moment that they announced this was going to be a complete siege, where they're cutting off the food, the electricity, the water from getting into Gaza, 
and doing collective punishment from that instance this was all illegal okay from that instance this was completely in contradiction to the Leahy law so sorry i'm not impressed okay is i guess my point sorry i'm not impressed that you're rolling out potentially some limited sanctions against one idf battalion that the Israeli military says, the Israeli government says, is representative of their entire operation in Gaza, and you're saying and doing absolutely nothing about the ongoing human rights violations. I mean, I just covered the story earlier today. Congress just passed, and Biden is going to sign, upwards of $26 billion for Israel. You can't keep giving them billions of dollars in weapons with no strings attached whatsoever. And then also, by the way, we're going to get to this green lighting, the Rafah invasion. You can't do that while you're simultaneously pretending to crack down on human rights abuses. The whole thing is a human rights abuse. Now, here was Netanyahu's response. He says, sanctions must not be imposed on the IDF. In recent weeks, I've been working against the imposition of sanctions on Israeli citizens, including my conversations with senior American government officials. First off, they're not sanctions against just like random Israeli citizens. They're sanctions against an IDF battalion. Okay, and some of the other sanctions have been targeted against like specific Israeli settlers. We're not just talking about random citizens, okay? He says, at a time when our soldiers are fighting the monsters of terror, the intention to impose a sanction on a unit in the IDF is the height of absurdity and a moral low. The government headed by me will act by all means against these moves. So in other words, he's not going to abide by this. He's not going to listen to Joe Biden. So then what are you going to do about it? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. You're going to keep giving them billions in weapons. They're going to keep putting it in the hands of these IDF battalions committing war crimes. And they're, you're, you're just going to keep going on and on like that. There's never going to be any breaking point for the Biden administration. They, they've demonstrated that over the last six months straight. Now, we also had this. Netanyahu's office hosts emergency talks on feared international criminal court warrants for the prime minister and other ministers as well, as well as IDF soldiers. So they're starting to wake up a little bit. Now, keep in mind, the Israeli government does not consider themselves to be uh, a part of the ICC. They're not signatories of the ICC. Uh, which I think in and of itself says a lot, that you're not willing to subject yourself to the standards of international law or the International Criminal Court, which by no means is, is perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But um, clearly, it seems like they're feel fearful here that potentially you could have arrest warrants that are issued, you know, which, which is going to make it incredibly difficult for Israeli government officials or IDF soldiers to go about their, their business, right? To travel, you know, under the threat of potential arrest, right? So I thought this was interesting. Now, I'll add on to this before we move on to the next thing, that not only do I think there needs to be, obviously, you know, war crimes tribunals for every member of the Israeli war cabinet, okay, as well as likely for U.S. officials who have been directly complicit in this every single step of the way, as well as IDF soldiers, but, you know, s some other countries have done this or, or have thought about doing this recently, and I think it's a good idea. We have soldiers that have come from all over the world, Western European countries, the United States, just choosing to go and fight inside of Gaza. I think that any soldier, any American citizen for that matter, as an American citizen myself, who decided, who chose to go and participate in this genocide should be thoroughly investigated. And then if it's found that they committed human rights abuses or war crimes, which is probably likely, two thirds of the people who have been killed in Gaza have been women and children, then they should be prosecuted as well. Sorry, I'm not comfortable with the idea that we have Americans that are choosing to go participate in a genocide and they may have gone over there and killed innocent men, women, and children and then they get to come back to the United States as if nothing ever happened. I'm not comfortable with that. I don't know about you guys. But moving on to this. So here from the Times of Israel, this is something we talked about before. It looks like this is, you know, after everything that happened with Iran and Israel and their back and forth, it seems like this may be accurate. So they say U.S. agreed to Israel's plan for Rafah invasion in return for not carrying out a large Iran strike. Of course, the United States is denying this, right? And they've had, so oh, we're, you know, worried, we're concerned about Israel's plans for Rafah. And are they going to do enough to care about civilians during this operation? No, of course they're not. There's no way to do an invasion of Rafah without it being an absolute humanitarian catastrophe and a nightmare that is going to kill civilians. But, you know, the, the, the main point here is that it looks like the United States agreed to greenlight Israel's invasion of Rafah, which is going to be catastrophic, no matter what, in exchange for Israel not starting World War III. That's basically what it looks like happened. Now, we, we covered the back and forth of what happened between Israel and Iran, right? Israel strikes 
an Iranian embassy or consulate or whatever you want to call it, and a massive escalation. Iran then retaliates to that, and they lob a bunch of drones and missiles towards Israel, knowing that they're going to get intercepted. They gave, you know, a 72-hour warning, right? Almost all of the missiles reportedly get intercepted. There's zero deaths that are reported from that Iranian response. And that was sort of their way to be like, okay, we're done. We're done. You killed a bunch of our top generals. You bombed our embassy. We lobbed a bunch of missiles that you shot out of the sky. Let's call it call it off, right? So Israel, of course, does not just leave it there. And then they go and they respond. And basically it looks like they lobbed, I mean, there's there's conflicting reports on this because we're getting one thing from Iran that has their own interests, one thing from Israel, one thing from the United States. They all have their own competing interests that are at play here. But it looks like, I'll just say this, Israel, although they did continue the escalatory ladder by striking back at Iran, it looks like it was not nearly as massive or as intense of a strike as they could have, okay? They could have bombed an Iran nuclear site, okay? But it looks like this was sort of the deal, right? And and there's further reporting. This is from uh, the New York Times. Israel planned a bigger attack on Iran, but scaled it back to avoid war. Really, it looks like, you know, because there was some mild pressure behind the scenes from the United States, from other countries as well. Hey, we don't want to go to war with Iran right now. Okay, so here, we'll let you continue to genocide Palestinians in Gaza in exchange for you not starting World War III. It's just a great foreign policy approach that we have going on here, right? Where, where basically, whether or not we start World War III is in the hands of somebody like Benjamin fucking Netanyahu. I mean, it's terrifying. It's genuinely terrifying. And it's terrifying the lengths that the United States will go to not just, you know, force Israel to end all of this, which they could tomorrow if they wanted to. They've chosen not to. Don't know what's happening with the Times of Israel. But we move on. So in terms of the upcoming Rafah invasion, here we have Israeli strikes on southern Gaza city of Rafah kill 22 mostly children as the u.s advances that aid package giving 26 billion some odd dollars to israel so a little bit of details on this they say israeli strikes on the southern city of rafa overnight killed 22 people including 18 children 18 out of 22 does this give you a little bit of an insight in terms of what this invasion of rafa is going to look like okay so at any time you hear the united states or Biden, they come out and they say, well, we believe there needs to be a targeted approach in Rafah, right? We believe they need to, you know, to take consideration of the civilians. Over a million people, half the population of Gaza is packed into Rafah because Israel has made life impossible everywhere else in Gaza. And so this is some of, these are some of the early strikes that are going on. 18 children out of 22 killed, okay? And this is happening, of course, as the United States is set to give them billions of dollars in military aid. Israel has carried out near daily raids on Rafah, air raids, where more than half of Gaza's population of 2.3 million has sought refuge from fighting elsewhere. It has also vowed to expand its ground off off offensive against the Hamas militant group in the city to the border or on the border of Egypt, despite calls for restraint. Okay, again, this is not going to be an offensive against the Hamas militant group. It's an offensive against the Palestinians who are there. In the coming days, this is Netanyahu here, we will increase the political and military pressure on Hamas because this is the only way to bring back our hostages and achieve victory. We will land more and we will land more and painful blows on Hamas soon. So he's saying it's inevitable. We're going to go into Rafah. Now, you know, notice here how he says this is the only way to bring back our hostages and achieve victory. No, it's not. No, it's not. Israel has killed more hostages than they have saved through military means. The huge bulk of, of the hostages that were returned to Israel happened early on, back in November, I think it was, when there was a hostage swap, when there was a deal that was made, a temporary ceasefire. That's the only time that a significant portion of the hostages made it back to Israel. The, the idea that invading Rafah is going to produce a situation where you save the hostages is utterly delusional. We, we've known for months, Netanyahu's coalition, the guys making the decisions here, do not prioritize saving the hostages. Again, if you did, if you wanted that, you would do a deal, okay? It's as simple as that. Israel's holding thousands of hostages right now that they could do as a part of a swap, right? They could get a ceasefire deal that's in place and they could have hostages swapped that way. That's what you would do if the hostages were your priority. That's not the priority. The priority is obliterating Gaza and, and they've been massively successful in that. Saving hostages through military means, not so successful. Right? Remember that story of them killing three of their own hostages who were waving white flags and speaking in Hebrew? 
which tied in to the stories at the time of the Israeli kill zones where the IDF and the commanders in the field essentially give them permission to kill any military-aged man that they see. And they go and they kill their own hostages who are waving white flags and speaking Hebrew. So this is what the Rafah invasion is going to look like. And again, seems like it's imminent and on the horizon. We also had some more you know, atrocities that were uncovered recently. So here we have Mehdi Hassan um, talking about this. He says, don't be silly, Muhammad. The mainstream media doesn't have time for mass graves as they are busy covering college campus protests against the people who dug those graves. So I'm going to talk tomorrow probably more about what's happening on college universities, campuses all around the country, and Biden's absolutely disgusting response to all of that. But I mean, here we have again, this is not the first story of mass graves inside of Gaza that I've covered on this channel. This one was at Nasser Hospital in Khan Yunus. So recently the IDF did somewhat of a pull pullout from Khan Yunus, and this is what was found in the aftermath. 190 bodies, they, they say hundreds more potentially expected, and, and almost nobody is covering this. A mass grave with potentially hundreds of bodies in it near a hospital, Nasser Hospital. So, I mean, guys, listen, like, I've shown you guys how many countless atrocities that we've seen. Hind Rajab and, and the follow-up, you know, massacre of the ambulance workers who were coordinating with the IDF to go and try to save her. The, the numerous flower massacres that we've talked about. The relentless targeting of civilians in civilian infrastructure. We've covered so many different aspects of this. And yet, we're barely scratching the surface, guys. Barely scratching the surface of, of the unimaginable horrors that are directly underneath the surface in Gaza. And so as time goes on, we're going to see more and more stories like this. And this is this is part of the reason why, you know, when we talk about the death count, is it 30,000, 40,000, what is it? You know, I give you guys the latest numbers from like Euromed Human Rights Monitor to try to get somewhat of a gist of where we're at right now. But when you see stories like this, it, it really does convince me that the official numbers that are being reported right now have to be a drastic undercount. They have to be. Because those numbers do not take into consideration shit like this. The, these bodies were not counted by anybody. They were thrown into mass graves after they were killed by the IDF. So who knows what the actual tally is at right now. And I'll finish off with this, just to remind you guys, this is not just happening in Gaza, okay? And, and this is the, you know, one of the most frustrating aspects of debates that I see around this. We're on a targeted hunt for Hamas, right? Oh, well, it's just Hamas standing in the way of, uh, you know, the, the civilians are standing in the way of us and Hamas, and it's unfortunate that they're dying, but, you know, this, this is really just a targeted war against Hamas militants. So then why is this happening in the West Bank? An Israeli raid on the Nur Shams refugee camp in the occupied West Bank has caused some of the worst destruction in decades, according to this Al Jazeera reporter. So I'm just going to scroll through this so you guys can see some of what has been done recently. This is in the West Bank, not Gaza. This is the West Bank. 12 hours of raids. Look at the destruction here, guys. They're taking bulldozers to, looks like, residential housing or shops. They say they destroyed roads. They dug up the roads here. Buildings, shops, houses, sewage lines. I mean, they go on to describe more and more of what this looks like. Look at this. This is them tearing up the roads in the West Bank. They have a machine here just designed to, to put a massive hole in the road and then to dig up sewage lines. This is the kind of destruction that you would expect to see in Gaza from some of these airstrikes. This is happening in the West Bank. So what's what's the excuse there? You know, because and this brings me back to the original story that we started with Biden imposing limited sanctions on one IDF battalion. And it's probably not even really enforceable, you know, but we're doing this because oh, we're trying to crack down on the human rights abuses. The human rights abuses are part and parcel of the standard operating procedure of the Israeli government, okay? It's not oopsie-daisy mistakes here and there, and there's a few bad apples. This is government policy that we're talking about here, okay? You don't just have a couple IDF soldiers going rogue in the West Bank and tearing up the roads. This is part of the ethnic cleansing campaign of Palestinians in the West Bank. During the last six months, we've seen historic numbers of settlements that are approved by the Israeli government. This is them explicitly saying, we don't want a two-state solution. We don't want to, to live in peace with Palestinians. We are going to continue to genocide the population in Gaza. We are going to continue to ethnically cleanse the Palestinian population in the West Bank. And that's that. And so the Biden administration coming out and doing these limited 
half-assed, non-enforceable sanctions. Am I supposed to give applause for that? I mean, again, it's like one quarter step in the right direction when you have a hundred yard dash in front of you. And it's also like you're taking 10 steps back anyways, because you're also giving them the weapons that they're using to commit human rights abuses. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's deeply unserious, deeply frustrating. And, um, yeah, I mean, I'll have, I'll have more for you guys in the coming days because this shit is not going anywhere. If anything, it seems like it's just going to escalate, uh, rapidly as we head towards this potential ground invasion of Rafa. Politic guy has the best politic. Believe me. No one does it like him. Believe me. Everyone is saying.